I forgot my attendance sheets. So that means that everyone gets a free seminar, I guess. <laughs> but you can't leave yet. <laughs> yeah, so I, I totally forgot the attendance sheet. Um, OK. But um, yeah, we'll get started. So today, we're going to have a seminar on graduate student policy. Uh, this seminar is really designed to give you an overview of some of the key policies uh, that you really need to know in order to get through your graduate studies smoothly, right? I know that this is designed mostly for the first year graduate student, uh, but every year we do make some updates, or, you know, additional clarification to some of the policies, so hopefully you'll find some new materials here. Okay. Um, and you know, the, I'll, I'll share the slides with you after the seminar, and the seminar is also recorded, so you'll have that as a reference right, if you need to go back look at it. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the graduate admission structure. So who should you go to if you have questions, basically? Um, hopefully everyone by now knows that I'm Boyang Jiang. I'm the associate chair of the department. Um, and uh, my responsibility is to oversee the graduate policy. So I do make some updates to, to the policy annually. Um, and I also uh, uh, approve and assign a number of documents, for example, your comprehensive exam topics, right? Your committee member come up with a topic, and uh, um, I sign off on, on that topic, and you'll see my signature on the on the exam letters, right? Um, I also sign off on your annual committee meeting report. So all graduate students, you need to do a committee meeting. So you submit a report, and then you have the meeting with your committee members. After the meeting, uh, then your committee member provides comments and assign a satisfactory grades right to the committee to the report um, and then you also uh, say whether you are satisfied with your supervisor's supervision or not on the report and that's really the two main things I check on the report whether you are making satisfactory progress or whether you're satisfying satisfying with your uh, supervisor supervision if there's any issue there then that's a red flag then there will be a additional action after that right um, so if, if, and we're going to talk more about this, if you have any concern about supervision, uh, please, please feel free to talk to me. Um, you know, we can always set up a meeting, but the committee report is also one way of voice that concern, although it's a lot more official than just contact me um, individually, right? But, but that's your one way of reaching out. Um, and you can also come to me with any general question about just graduate study. Um, I'm also here to help you with scholarship. So I have uh, examples of successful scholarship applications. So if you need those, feel free to reach out to me. I can provide those to you. And uh, I can help you with uh, your research proposal. And if you reach out to any referees that, uh, who needs to provide recommendation letters, uh, if they're not sure what to write or how to draft a recommendation letter, I can also help with that, OK? Um, special circumstances. So this is anything that prevents you from successfully completing your graduate study. You can reach out to me. I'm here to help with that. Okay. Um, Laura Nice is our graduate assistant. Um, she's, if you have any issue with course registration or just registration in general, then um, she will help you with that. And she help with thesis submissions. Um, now you are responsible for setting up your supervisor committee meeting every year. Uh, but once you determine the date, you can reach out to Laura. She can help you um, find a room for the meeting. And there, for PhD student, there's also an online system that needs to be uh, triggered. So you have to go through this online system. She's also the one that provides you with access to that. Uh, Laura Nis is uh, also in charge of scheduling the comprehensive exam for you for PhD student. Uh, she's, uh, she will find you a chair. Uh, and work with the committee member to come up with a topic. She's the one that uh, who will issue you that comprehensive exam letter, right? So you get that letter from her. Um, Christina is in charge of everything related to money. Right? So if you have any question about your payroll, uh, when you get paid, how much you should get paid, then um, talk to Christina, okay? She also assigns desk space uh, for graduate students. 
and she's also in charge of TA assignments. So I think now the way it works is uh, this graduate student, you come up with your first, second, third choice for the course you want to TA, and then the faculty member will do the same. Then Christina is just there to help uh, match the student with the professors. Michelle Whelan is um, the undergrad assistant, but uh, so most of most of the time she's uh, she's there to help the undergraduate student. But in some cases, she's uh, her responsibility is also relevant to the graduate student. For example, if you are TAing for a course, if you need to print an exam or assignments, uh, you're more than welcome to use the coffee machine in the camp manager office. So reach out to her about that. Um, other than the committee meeting and the comprehensive exam, if you need to book a room for anything um, or any events, uh, you reach out to Michelle. She's also in charge of shipments and she's uh, helping with the graduate seminar. So this is why occasionally you get the email from her uh, that advertise on uh, the uh, researchers that are coming to our department for the research seminars, okay? Okay, so again, I, I'm gonna share the slides with you so you will have this. Um, now because of the limit, a limited time we have today, we won't be able to go through all the graduate policy. I'm just giving you the, really the highlights, but everything, uh, all the graduate policy are written in this uh, graduate student handbook. So this is the official document for uh, all the policy that governs how we run things in the department for graduate students, okay? Um, if there's any, uh, you know, thoughts or debates about any issues, then we refer back to this handbook and we interpret this handbook. Um, and to access this grad student handbook, you just go to our department website under resources uh, and click on graduate student, then this is a PDF file that you can download, okay? Um, it's a great resource, especially for first year student, I rec highly recommend you to really read through it um, it also provides you with uh, everything you really need to know on the process of comprehensive exam, committee meeting, uh, how, to, how to get paid. So everything is there, okay. And, and we do update this document every year. Um, so the 2022 to 2023 version uh, should be uploaded online now. Okay. All right, grad pay. Uh, so I think we're doing pretty well uh, for our department compared to the other departments. So no matter, you know, it doesn't matter if you're international student, domestic student, master or PhD, you will get a minimum net pay or stipend of $18,000. So that is our minimum for the de department, right, as you can see here. So this is after you pay the tuition and all the fees. So you will have at least eighteen thousand dollars to take home for living expenses. Okay. Now if you are getting scholarship, like OGS or NSERC scholarship, then this minimum goes up. You can see the minimum can be as high as twenty-five thousand, twenty-eight thousand dollars. Okay. Now if you are domestic PhD that gets NSERC or um, uh, OGS NSERC scholarship, like CG, CS, CGS scholarship, then your minimum can be as high as $45,000. So that is quite a big difference, okay? So this is why for domestic students, if you are eligible for these uh, NSERC scholarship, I highly encourage you to really take your time to, you know, to do well on the application to apply for these scholarship because that could make a, a big difference to your living conditions, okay? Um, and for PhD student, after you pass your comprehensive exam, you will get additional one thousand right? dollar. And so that's that's the what that the policy of the department. So the department pays you extra one thousand dollar off as a sort of a reward after you pass your comprehensive exam. Um, now, just this is not that important for you to know, but I, here I just want to point out. You can see this is the research scholarship is what your supervisor pays you, right, in order to satisfy this minimum requirement. So you're getting funding from the scholarships, answer scholarships, you're getting funding from department, from faculty, also from your supervisor, from all, and also TA assistantship. So from all of these resources, and this is what your supervisor have to 
pay you. Um, now this is more relevant for your supervisor, but what I want to highlight here, you can see that for master, international master student, your supervisor have to pay you quite a lot, uh, $25,000, $28,000. Uh, compared to domestic student, which is really only $2,000, $3,000. So which is why uh, in the admission process, you know, your supervisor will, there's a, uh, more incentive to recruit as a PhD student. So you are getting your scholarship funding um, in the beginning of each term, right? Fall, winter, and spring term, okay? And, uh, um, and then you are getting your pay from teaching assistantship uh, in the term that you have TA, okay? And then you're getting paid bi-weekly, okay? But only in the term that when, when you have a TA. Um, and then the research scholarship, this is from your supervisor, that's paid to you bi-weekly throughout the entire year, okay? And then you have to pay tuition on your own in the beginning of each term, okay? So you can see money from different sources coming at different rates at different time. And then you have to pay the tuition yourself at the beginning of each term. So you really need to budget your expense. So just because you get a big lump sum of money in the beginning of a term doesn't mean you need to spend it all, right? So you really need to understand how much you're getting on average per year and kind of budget according to that. Okay. So like I said, you pay the tuition yourself. Um, so what that means, the amount of uh, money you're getting is actually higher than this minimum amount shown, okay? And uh, so because it includes the tuition fees, okay? So you're, you need to deduct that tuition fee and that's how much you, uh, you can use for a living expense. Now for most supervisors uh, in our department, it really depends on the, the program, uh, the supervisor tends to pay you more than the minimum. So it's, you know, you, this, this is really the department minimum uh, but usually the supervisor will top you up a little bit on top of this, um, especially if you're a senior PhD student, after a few years, your supervisor tends to kind of top you up more over time as you become more experienced, right? Um, but they're not obligated to, to do that. Um, again, if you have any questions about your, uh, your stipend, your pace, uh, or any issues, any kind of hardship issues, please feel free to talk to uh, Christina. The department does have some flexibility on some of the, uh, some of the stipend pay or TA, uh, TA payment, things like that. So if you really have uh, some hardship, then please talk to Christina for help. The university also have this emergency loan program, which uh, can help pay for some of the expenses before your scholarship comes in uh, later on. Okay, um, career planning milestones. I think all the graduate students need to do this once in their, uh, in their graduate study. And this is usually done in their first year. Okay, and this is required for graduation. It's really simple. Um, it, I think it's just a form that you have to fill out. The form asks you some questions, like what is your long-term career goal? What is it that you want to learn during your graduate study in order to uh, meet that career goal that, you, that, you, that you're aiming for? So something like that. And you just need to complete that form and then submit it to Laura, I believe. And I think I also signed off on that form and then it gets uh, submitted to SGS for approval. And that will, um, that's how you satisfy this criteria. You should be getting an email from career service that asks you to do this and provide they, I think they will provide instruction in that email. Okay. Now, but in addition to this, I highly encourage everyone to get to know our career development program from the career service in the Faculty of Engineering. They can really help you with developing your CV, resumes, okay? And I think they also have uh, access to opportunity for co-ops, things like that. And uh, you know, they can help you develop networking skill, interviewing, preparing for interviews, 
and just career planning in general. Um, especially for students who are about to graduate, you should really at least get to know the, what kind of resources they have, right? And in, in case it's relevant to you or can be useful to you. Okay. All right, uh, course, courses, okay? Um, so first, just some terminology. Uh, when we say half a course, that really means a typical course over one term. So one, a course that's, uh, that, that's, uh, that takes, um, that use up an entire semester, right, one term. So that's a half course. And there's also these uh, quarter courses. So these are six week course, so kind of like a half a term. We used to have some of these quarter courses, but I don't think we have it anymore. Uh, I know that graduate student, there are these uh, two machine learning courses, like 788, 789, uh, but they uh, merged now into one half course so for just one full term, I believe. Um, and so I, other than that, I don't think there, there are any other uh, quarter courses, okay? For a course to count towards your graduation requirement, uh, after you complete the course, there needs to be a designation of distinction after that labeled after that course. So M is for master, D is for PhD, right, for PhD requirements. Okay. And we, we can talk about this. So all the courses from the School of Engineering and Applied Science, Faculty of Science, Faculty, Faculty of Health Science, and School of Biomedical Engineering, um, they will count as technical courses, okay? Now the courses from the School of Engineering Practice and School of Business of Education, so these are economic courses, business courses, they can count as non-technical courses, okay? Um, but there are also other requirements and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, all the courses from Chemical Engineering Department obviously will count as technical courses Right, and any, uh, any courses that cross-listed with chemical engineering department would also count, okay? If there's any issue, uh, any kind of, um, if you're not sure about whether a course should count or not, please you know, talk to me. And uh, uh, you can also file a petition to have a course count towards your degree, um, but that's a more lengthy process. You sh again, you should talk to me about that first. Hopefully you won't be in that situation. For a course to count towards a graduate study, uh, you have to get a B plus, uh, sorry, B minus or higher grade on the, on the course, okay. All right, now let's talk about the course requirement. For a master student who entered our program before fall of 2018, I don't think we have any students in this category anymore. So that's like five years ago right, for a master's student. Um, but the requirement is three half course. So these are the three one-term course. And two of the three needs to be in 700 level. Two of the three needs to be in ChemEng. Okay, and these, all of these has to be technical engineering courses. Okay. For a master's student who entered our program after the fall of 2018, same requirement, you need three courses. Two of the three needs to be 700, two of the three needs to be ChemEng, but one of the three can be a non-technical course. So courses from a uh, school of uh, business, right, or uh, education, a business or economic courses, things like that, okay? But you need to ask your supervisor to get your supervisor to approve those non-technical courses before you take them. So check with your supervisor first if you want to take a course that's outside of you know, this, this technical area, right? Basically any courses in the School of Engineering Practice, School of Business Education, just check with your supervisor, get their approval before you take it. Now it depends on when you start. Um, if you start after the fall of 2018, then one of those courses can count towards your degree requirement. For a PhD who already have a master, uh, but they join us before the fall of 2018, then you need to take three, uh, three courses, uh, two of them, two of the three uh, at 700 level and two of the three in, within ChemEng department. Okay. 
for a PhD student who has a master but entered our program after the fall of 2018. Same, again, same requirement, but one of the three courses can be a non-technical course. Uh, for PhD student, for direct entry PhD students, students who don't have a master degree and joined our program before fall of 2018, you need to take six courses, which is a lot. You need to take six courses. Is there anyone in this category? I'm just curious. Okay, okay, we have a couple. So gradually we'll phase out these. these. <laughs> yeah. So, and the four of the six need to be 700, Four of, the three need, uh, four of the six need to be in Cambridge, okay? Um, and then for PhD student, direct entry PhD student, uh, join us after fall of 2018, then same, uh, okay, so that, uh, then you just need four courses. So much lighter load, and three of the four, 700, three of the four within Cambridge, and one of the four can be a non-technical. I think a lot of people are in, probably in this category. Um, so for a PhD student that transfer from a master program, so bypassed from a master, and then you transfer before the fall of 2018, uh, you still have to take three courses for your PhD program, and then in addition to the three, you still have to meet all the requirements of a master degree. So that, you know, the master requires three courses, so that's a total of six courses as well, okay? But for a PhD student who transferred after the fall of 2018, you just need to take one more course, uh, one 700 level ChemEng course, plus all the original requirement for the master degree. So lighter mode, lighter load. Okay, so if you're, if ultimately you want to get a PhD degree, and if currently if you're in a master program, um, I highly, if you like your project, I highly encourage you to consider bypass to a PhD. Because once you get a PhD degree, your master degree doesn't really matter. No one really look at that anymore, right? Um, so if, you, if ultimately your goal is to get a PhD, and then uh, you like your project, you like your lab enough, then really consider uh, bypass from a master, and you can do this usually at the, this one year mark after you start your master, okay? And the benefit here is that everything you have done for your master can then go into your PhD uh, degree or your PhD thesis. If you have graduated with a master, that means the work you have done during your master needs to go into your master thesis, then anything that goes into your master thesis cannot be used again for your PhD then you have to do more work for PhD, right? Um, so you know, consider this uh, bypassing into a PhD if, that's, if this is what you want. And the bar is not that high. You just need to be able to, uh, in order to do this, you just need to you know, show that you are productive in your research and uh, the, the requirement is you just need support from your supervisor. If your supervisor supports this, then that indicates you are you are making good research progress, and you need to finish two graduate courses with a B plus or higher average, and that's it. That's really the requirement to bypass. Um, like I said, the ideal time to bypass is uh, at this one year mark into your uh, master program, um, but the latest time here is not after, so it cannot be done uh, six terms later after you enter the master program. Because the master usually takes two years, six term, right? So you should be done, graduated by then. Um, so if you want to do this, uh, talk to your supervisor first, and also feel free to talk to me about this as well. And um, um, just because you bypass, you still have to do a PhD comprehensive exam. So that's a completely separate thing that happens during your PhD, um, so this does not avoid the need for a PhD comprehensive exam. Okay. Um, and like I said, the non-technical course from the, uh, the, the School of uh, Business or Education, so you can, depends on when you start your program, you can take these courses but get approval from your supervisor first. Um, 
Yeah, otherwise it, they, they, can, they won't be count, counted towards your degree requirement. Okay. Now you are actually allowed to take actual courses, uh, not for your degree requirement, but just actual for courses that you think uh, for self-improvement, right, if you want. Um, um, but you just need to uh, get your supervisor's approval for that. Okay. And then for graduate student, you don't pay extra for the actual courses. But you get uh, you don't get credit for it. Okay, supervisor committee meeting. Um, so the deadline for supervisor committee meeting is a little bit strange. Um, basically, if you start in September, say this year, then you can have your first committee meeting before November 30th next year. So you have a one year of time. But if you start it any time before September, say in May or January this year, then you have to have your first committee meeting before end of November this year. So you have less than one year of time. So no, end of November is sort of the cutoff uh, timeline for committee meeting. Okay? So it depends on when, when you start. Okay? Um, so just keep that in mind. Now you can have your committee meeting earlier than November 30th. Uh, in fact, I recommend everyone to consider have your committee meeting sometime in the summer when your committee member or supervisor have more time or more available. Just get it out of the way in, in the summer, right? Don't wait till the last minute. November can be a really busy month, especially when everyone are trying to schedule a committee meeting. Okay. Um, now there is uh, some tricks, right? If you really hate committee meeting, um, for master student, uh, consider considering bypassing to a PhD, you have that flexibility to determine when you officially bypass to a PhD. So if you say, I want to bypass in September, then you skip a committee meeting you know, for, for one year. <laughs> so you don't have to do it until the year after. So if you really hate committee meeting, don't bypass in May or January, right? With that said, I want to tell you that your committee members are really there to help you. They're not just there to judge you, to evaluate you, they're there to help you. So please you know, feel free to schedule like an informal individual meeting with your committee member. Uh, no one can stop you doing that, right? You, anytime, just email them, so I want to chat, I want to talk to you individually, get to know them and ask for their help or guidance. Um, they should be more than happy to, to, to meet with you and give them a chance to get to know you because later on, you're gonna need their help to, give, to provide you with some recommendation letter, right? When you apply for jobs or other uh, postdocs or other things. Um, so they will be the best people that can provide that recommendation letter, um, but you need to give them a chance to get to know you. So don't be afraid of meeting with your um, committee members. And um, I know that a committee meeting is, very, is a formal meeting. Um, to kind of alleviate stress for those meetings, the best uh, thing to do is to meet with them informally on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, um, you do have to take this deadline seriously. So make sure you do have a committee meeting before end of November. Uh, and that's because if you don't have a meeting, so this record goes to SGS. If they don't get this record, then they could, um, um, th there will be some consequences. Your grad pay could be affected, right? Uh, remember that research scholarship that sh your supervisor have to pay you, pay you that uh, the amount of money that your supervisor have to pay you could go up significantly because uh, SGS could take away faculty support or department support. And uh, so there, if you don't complete the committee meeting on time, right? So there will be some consequence to your grad pay. So take it seriously, get it in there on time before November 30th. Okay. For PhD students, you do this committee meeting, there's an online form, you access the form online, submit everything online, and then the, uh, the committee member provides a grade, um, uh, sign off on it on, uh, all online. So this is a complete online system. But for master students, um, you also have to have a committee meeting, but this is less formal. It's a form that you have to fill out. And uh, 
So master is two years, right? And you should have a committee meeting at the one year mark. Right? At the two year mark, that's when you have your master defense. But at the one year mark, that's when you should have a committee meeting. And, but this, for, for our department, this meeting, you can have this meeting just with your supervisor. You're not required to have it with your committee member, okay? And so that's what I mean by it's less formal. So if you meet with your supervisor, the two of you could just fill out this form, submit it, and, and that's it, okay? But I encourage you to meet with your committee member at this one year mark because you don't want to meet with your committee member for the first time by the time you defend your master. Uh, you want to get a chance to know what, uh, what is their expectation. You know, just get to know them before you have a master defense right, at the two year mark. Okay. So you should ask to meet with your committee member and uh, your supervisor cannot say no, right? They, they have to allow you to meet with your committee members. Yeah, so for, for PhD students, you should be getting this email from SGS to ask you to set up a, your annual committee meeting. Uh, but don't wait for this email, because you know when you need to have a meeting, just get it off the way in advance. By the time you get this email from them, usually it means you're pretty late, okay? And, uh, but you do need this email, to, I think, to access the online form. Um, if you need to start that process, just email Laura, just say, I want to set up my committee uh, meeting, and uh, can you uh, send me an email uh, with the link to this online system? Okay. And then you are responsible to arrange your committee meeting time, and once you determine the time, ask Laura to book a room for you, um, and then you complete the online, you submit your report. Uh, after the committee meeting, I think your supervisor fill out their portion of the report and then it goes to the committee member. They will provide a comment and also a grade and then it goes to me, I sign off on it and then it goes to SGS. All right, if you are on a leave, um, then all the deadline for all of these meetings just automatically gets extended by the duration of your leave. Okay. Now for, for your committee members, uh, for both PhD and master, uh, the com your committee member should be your supervisor and your co-supervisor, if you have any, plus one member, faculty member from our can manage department, plus one more uh, member, either from our can manage department or from outside of our department, okay? So this rule was not very clear before. This is one of the things we clarified in our, uh, in the graduate student handbook. Now, it's totally fine that both faculty members, a committee member can be from can manage department. If you don't need uh, help from anyone outside the department, that's totally fine. But at least one of the two needs to be from our can manage department plus your supervisor, co-supervisor. And the reason for this is we want to make sure uh, in your, co your committee member, the majority of your committee members are from can manage department so that um, they would have the final say on the policy related to can manage. You know, we don't want a uh, faculty member from outside of the department determine whether you can graduate or not. Right? So that's, this is why majority of the um, committee member needs to be, needs to be from can manage. Okay. And then you should determine your committee members as soon as possible, uh, ideally within the six weeks after you start your program. and comprehensive exam does not count as a committee meeting. So in the year when you have a comprehensive exam, you need still have to have a committee meeting. Um, all right, comprehensive exam. So Professor Hoare talked about this in a great detail a few weeks ago, so I'm not gonna go into this too much. Um, but just the logistic, you're supposed to have a comprehensive exam, a PhD comprehensive exam between uh, six and 18 months after you start your PhD program, okay? And then you have, uh, you'll be given a research topic. You have three weeks to write a report. The report is about 25 pages long. And then you submit a report. After that, you have one more week to prepare for oral presentation, okay? 
and then you have your commit uh, your comprehensive exam meeting. You give a presentation, and then your committee, uh, your your comprehensive exam member will determine whether you pass or fail the exam. If you fail the first time, you will get one more chance after that. Okay. Now another thing is you're not supposed to do anything else during this one month, three weeks plus one week, this one month of your, when you are doing your comprehensive exam. You don't have to TA, you don't have to attend any you know, lab meetings, you don't have to take any courses, uh, you don't have to do anything. If uh, your supervisor or anyone else asks you to do something, you can say, I'm doing my comprehensive exam, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to spend 100% of my time on this, so you don't have to do anything during that one month. And this is, this is your protected time. Uh, if there's any issue there, feel free to talk to me or talk to your uh, comprehensive exam chair. Okay. So you're supposed to get all the time you need to do this exam. Um, okay. So the Kenman 700 seminar, uh, don't forget to register for this. You need to register for both term one and term two. You don't need to register for summer term, but just one and two, but you do need to register. I, I have already shared the co course outline, the schedule, right, the assessment method, everything with you with email, so you should have received that email already, and if not, uh, I'll share the PowerPoint, so there's a link uh, you can click on to get access to that outline. Um, for PhD student, you're supposed to present at least once in our MuCheck or metric conference in order to graduate. That's your graduation requirement. If you don't get a chance to do that, you can also present at our department seminar uh, series. And so if you need to do that before you graduate, and then if you can't do it in, the, in, in these two conferences, then talk to me, I will then add you to the schedule you can present uh, once in our, uh, in our seminar series. Okay, so what it takes to graduate. Okay, usually it's about two years for master's student, four years for PhD student. Okay, and you are guaranteed support uh, for two years if you're a master's student for, and you're guaranteed support for four years for PhD student. So everything I talk about, about the minimum stipend requirement, all that, so that's your guaranteed support of that uh, for four years for PhD student. Okay. Now after that, you can still, if you cannot finish your uh, degree completely, you can still keep going, but you are not guaranteed a financial support, which means you could be paying the tuition yourself, you could be paying all your living expenses yourself. Right? Your supervisor are not obligated to support you after that. However, I think most supervisors do support you, you know, as long as you are doing the best you can, you are doing the work, making the progress you need to do, they, they will usually support you even after that, uh, but just don't count on it because they're not, they not obligated to do that, okay? Um, the university also have a limit, a time limit. For PhD student, it's six years, so you have to finish in six years. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still within the limit? You should, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to finish within six years. Otherwise, the university would kick you out. <laughs> and then on your transcript, you get uh, terminated due to term limit. That's, that's kind of what you get on your transcript. Um, so that's a university imposed limit. There's nothing you can do about this. Um, so really talk to your supervisor, make sure you get out before this. Okay, and then it's three years for master's student. Okay. All right, so what do you need to do to graduate? Now this varies significantly between labs, between research field, right, and also even between projects. Um, usually it's about three to four first author paper for a PhD student, one or two first author papers for a master's student. Okay. Um, like my impression is that if you have three papers or four, four papers, first author paper published, accepted, in, for your PhD, you, you're pretty much guaranteed to graduate. It's very hard for your committee member to say no for whatever reason, right? You, because your paper is, you submitted it, 
reviewers reviewed it, they accepted, this is a valid work. So it's, it, it, you can have a, what we call a sandwich thesis, basically you just take the paper, staple them together, you're done, right? Um, is if you have that already, it's very hard for your committee members to say, no, you cannot graduate. I mean, you know, they have to come up with a very you know, uh, a strong reason for that. But if you don't have this, then that you, if you say if you have uh, two papers or even one papers, but you have uh, other works that's not published, you can still have a written thesis, uh, but then ultimately it's up to the committee members to decide whether you have enough work there to graduate or not. Okay. So it's sort of a rule of thumb. Uh, for the master's student, again, depends on your research area. Sometimes you might not even have any paper published, but you probably have done enough work to submit a paper, or you probably have submitted a paper, it's just still under review. That's still okay for graduate, uh, to, to get a master's degree. Again, depends on your lab, Ultimately, this is decided by your committee member and your supervisor. And this is why it is so important for you to go talk to your committee member, formally and informally, to understand their expectations. Okay. Um, I would recommend don't leave for a job without complete all your writing, your thesis, or your experiment. Now for PhD defense, Sometimes it's, uh, that's, that's a harder to schedule because it involves external members, someone from outside of our school. So that could take a long time to schedule. So it's okay that you submit your thesis, you're just waiting for that oral defense. And you, if you need to leave for another job, that's okay. You, you know, at some point you just come back for like one day or half a day to finish your oral defense, that's okay. But I would not recommend leaving without finishing your experiment, finish, without finishing all your writing. So you should submit your thesis. All right, scholarship. I mentioned scholarship is quite important. So the biggest scholarship is NSERC Vanier. Uh, provides you with uh, um, $50,000 per year for three years. Uh, and then your supervisor and the department will top you up a little bit on top of that. So you get a very decent salary there. Very competitive. If you are interested in applying for this, it's competitive, competitive, but it's not in, impossible. Right? So we do have people who get it. If you want to give it a try, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll find you some successful application that you can kind of um, take a look. Okay? I'll give yourself at least two to three months of time to prepare for this application. The application is very extensive. And the deadline is around September, October, but there is a departmental competition, there is a university level competition before you even move to the federal level, okay? It is open to international students, but the international venue is even more competitive. Uh, but with that said, don't be afraid, like, go for it, right? Um, and I think most graduate students get CGSD or PGSD. These are due in September each year. So just look for the, the email. Usually the department send an email announcement about these uh, scholarship application deadline. There is always an internal department deadline for this. Um, so look for this. And uh, for master's student, there's NSERC CGSM uh, that provides you with 12 months support. The deadline for this is a little bit later in December, usually in December each year. Okay. And this is all done online. So there's an online submission system. And uh, we also have OGS scholarship. You don't need to apply for OGS specifically. Just apply for answer CGS, answer PGS. If you're not successful there, then your application will automatically be considered for OGS scholarship, okay? Um, so for example, last year, we have only considered, so all the rejected answer application were uh, considered for OGS, and that was enough application to fill up the OGS quota that we have. All right, so this is my last slide. And this is my five advice to you uh, for your graduate study. Uh, number one is, you know, be curious, stay curious, uh, explore things that are interesting to you. I think everyone, the reason you are here is because you're curious about science, you know, you want to innovate, you want to create new things. You're, you know, you don't want to get a nine to five jobs, right? So you have that curiosity, curiosity in the beginning and you know, my advice to you is that keep that. I know that graduate school can be stressful sometimes, 
but don't lose that curiosity. Keep being curious. And also, likely this is your only chance to explore things freely, things that interest to you. You might not get this chance again after, uh, after you graduate, you know, when you move on to your future career. Um, so really, you know, looking back, like, you, you really should cher cherish your time in graduate, st in graduate school. Okay? Um, now also be prepared that you are innovating, right? You are creating something new and that is not easy. It really is not easy, right? There will be lots of failure. If something is obvious, you get it right the first time, then that won't be, that's not innovation, right? So it will not be easy. There will be bottleneck, that's given, right? That's the part of this the process. So you have to break through that bottleneck with some persistence, right? And you have to do that at least once, right? Because once you overcome that barrier, uh, then everything you do after that become more novel. Your literature review, your rationale for your thesis will become a lot, uh, will make a lot more sense after that, right? Uh, once you have, you have invented something novel and then you have opened the door for, you know, uh, for other things. So things will be a little bit more sunny on the other side and just be prepared that you have to break through some sort of barrier with persistence. And also be realistic. Towards the end of your PhD, especially towards the end of your PhD, you need to talk to your supervisor to have a clearly defined and limited objective for your project, for your paper. Now nothing is perfect. Nothing is gonna be, your paper is not gonna be perfect. You need to get it out there. You need to um, talk to your supervisor, figure out what exactly you really need to do to complete your work. You know, what is that limited objective? And, uh, and publish. Um, because you, you'll realize that you, know, you publish something, even though it's an incremental improvement, but that's okay, someone else will learn from your paper, will pick up on that, and will keep it going. Nothing is gonna be perfect. Um, you, need to, you need a publication to graduate. So even though I said stay curious, you know, explore things freely, but you also, towards the end, you also have to be realistic. You are, unless you're super lucky, otherwise you are making a very incremental improvement uh, in the field. And uh, you just, yeah, you're making a very small dent in, you know, in the overall human knowledge that we are, you know, we collective have. Um, so it's, you spend a lot of time on that, but you know, just realize that you, um, it's not gonna be a huge breakthrough, okay? Um, also, don't forget to develop your soft skills, okay? So try to be involved in uh, student leadership roles, entrepreneurship, trainings, and uh, if you're given a chance, you know, help with grant proposal writing, because these soft skill is what you can keep really for your entire career. Especially at later stage of your career, you're likely not gonna be the one who is doing the lab work, who is doing the, you know, using a technical skill. You're likely be the, gonna be the one that's supervising other people doing the lab work. So then at that stage, what matters most is your soft skills, okay? So take your time to develop that. And also, lastly, network. Um, you can be really good, but if you're completely isolated, then you're not gonna be able to maximize your capability. In this world, realize that having connections, having access to opportunity, information, that alone has values, right? So you need to network, uh, go to local international conferences whenever possible. I know that international conferences can be quite expensive, um, but you can, you know, whenever you get a chance, Go and also, you know, take advantage of the, all the local conferences, um, because the people sometimes the people around you could give you, could provide you with even more realistic opportunities that you can take advantage of. Right, and so don't underestimate the need for network. Uh, I can tell you that again at a later stage of uh, your career, depending on what you do, you will gradually lose all your technical capable, you know, <laughs> skills. What you end up using is soft skill, but what's even more important than soft skill is connections, right? You can attract or you know, successfully get a multi-million dollar grant just by ha simply having connections with the right people. So this, this is how the world works, right? So don't underestimate that and build that over time.
Um, okay, that's all I want to say. Any questions?